Welcome everyone. This is a webinar that we are creating about advanced integrative therapy and conducting research on its efficacy. But before we get into any of the specifics on what we're going to cover today, what we want to do first is just introduce ourselves, tell you a little bit about how we got into this or um, why we are so excited about it. Um, and then we'll be able to talk a little bit about hopefully how to get you excited about it too. So we're going to start with Tabitha. Just introduce yourself first, please. You got it, Beth. So my name is Tabitha Burke Weaver. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and a licensed professional counselor out in Oregon, the United States. Um, I have been using AIT for over a decade. Uh, probably closer to 15 years. And one of the things that has me very passionate is the depth of healing that has occurred not only in my own life, but in the life of literally every client I've ever used this technique with. And the other thing that makes me really passionate about this particular modality is that that healing lasts. Mm. And so other aspects may come up, but in general, we don't have to keep revisiting the same things. And so that is super helpful for the therapeutic process, of course. I began um, working with the research committee uh, so that I could figure out how to get AIT some more recognition. And as you know, continuing education credits, those are incredibly important for us. Yes. And so I decided to do a case study because I, I tend to be a little academic like that anyway. I love research um, and I had a great time. And so I'm really glad that we're doing this webinar to let people uh, experience that same thing if they would like to. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and my name is Beth Pace. I'm a licensed professional counselor supervisor in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and the way I found my way to AIT, which I've only been practicing for about a year and a half, um, is I would work with clients and there were some folks where like cognitive behavioral therapy or just kind of like appealing to um, their intellect worked. And they'd be like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to go home and, and do this. And I'd be like, oh, okay, cool. But there were folks that they'd be like, listen, I hear you. And what you're saying makes sense to my brain, but past a certain point, that doesn't feel true. I, I hear and I understand compassion focused therapy and I know that I don't deserve it, right? And so I was just like, what am I gonna do to help these folks, right? So for me, the challenge came from realizing that my skill set was not um, at the place where I was equipped to support um, those folks. And I, I can't even really tell you what year this was. I know it was maybe about three or four years ago. I happened to read The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk. And I also happened to talk to a colleague of mine who had recently been EMDR trained. And she, five years ago, was like, I don't know. It seems like you just wag your finger in front of somebody's face. And like, I don't really like see how that works. And I'm like, yeah, me too. I feel the same way. And so then I read that book. And then she had gotten EMDR trained and came back around and was like, you are not going to believe how effective this is. So I got trained in EMDR and lo and behold, I was able to do a lot more and make a lot of, of, of like headway with some of those folks that were feeling so stuck in their, their trauma. Mm. And yet I was still bumping into some people who couldn't let EMDR work because it didn't feel safe. Um, it felt kind of like packing C4 into the sub basement of their psyche and then just like, <laughs> like blowing things up. Um, and one of the great takeaways from that book, uh, the body keeps the score, which is one of the like seminal works on, you know, trauma and how it's stored in the body is that Bessel van der Kolk says, if, if you're a therapist, why don't you go try receiving that intervention to see if you actually, if it works for you, if you can feel it working, then you're going to be a lot more um, installed and excited about sharing with other people. So I kind of stumbled upon an AIT therapist who was also EMDR trained. And then in receiving AIT, I was just like, 
oh yeah, okay, that makes perfect sense. So mm -hmm. I went and got AIT trained and then found myself a little astonished um, that not enough people knew about this intervention. Yeah. And so for me, uh, when I think about, you know, what research does um, for our profession is it also helps educate people on some of the, the newest, the freshest, and some of the most effective ways on working in support of our clients. Um, the other thing research does is makes you more expert, kind of no matter, um, no matter where you start. So that's why I got pretty excited about getting on the AIT research committee was because I, I found myself utilizing an intervention that I knew was really effective, but that other people were like, well, yeah, but that's kind of like woo woo energy, you know, that's not legitimate. And I, um, I kind of took that personally. <laughs> so I was like, well, what do I do about it? And lo and behold, there is something to do about that to kind of help support and legitimize something that we know to be effective. Absolutely. And just on the woo woo part, um, AIT using the chakric system is really lovely because we are resourced for thousands of years around meaning, around location, and how to coordinate that with current psychotherapy. So as a chakra expert, uh, AITI is my favorite place to go for therapeutic interventions. Yeah. And the more research that comes out about energy interventions or some of the ancient ways of healing, uh, that you're thinking about the comparison between like bilateral stimulation and drumming, right? Um, or, you know, the chakras and the endocrine system and like where it is, um, kind of like where it's crisscrossing in your body. Um, and so the more that we have the capacity to study the ancient ways, the more we see like, oh yeah, they, of course they work, but now we can show how they work, which then gives kind of more Western minded folks, no disrespect, um, something that feels comfortable to say like, well, the research shows, the research shows, the research shows that this is how this works. Um, so then the next question is, you know, why, why would, why would we encourage someone? Why are we doing this webinar? Um, why do you need research on AIT? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that research is important in general. And so I felt passionate about AIT because I wanted to start supporting the idea that we can ethically have guidelines on how to use the chakra system. And we can also learn enough that we can fundamentally start training a whole new group of people to contribute to the field by offering continuing education. And as we both know, Beth, <laughs> uh, if you're licensed and you want the, any type of training to count towards your requirements for your state licensure, you have got to have CEUs. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that was just a core thing. It's like, we've got to get this online. So that was one of the things that motivated me. Um, yeah. The other is I just like contributing to my field, and I've done that in many ways over the years from lobbying Congress <laughs> over medical rights to this research. And so I would ask people to, to look in and find if it is important for you to contribute. And is this a way that might work? What comes up for you? Um, I'm a businesswoman first and foremost. And so when I think about how that is, how conducting research is immediately uh, valuable to me, um, is I think about how it could help you build your practice. Mm -hmm. um, so you can say to someone like, oh yeah, I'm actually like, there's, there's research out there about this intervention that I'm, I am proposing that we use. Um, and then, you know, you can sort of cough and be like, <laughs> that I conducted. Um, and so, you know, it's not necessarily about feeding the ego, but thinking about that as like a branding or like a business management strategy. So it isn't just like, I want you to trust me and take this leap of faith that this intervention that I'm proposing that we use be, um, be the the intervention of choice we can say there's already a growing body of research that's showing that this is ethic this is like efficacious um and then i think that that's a real a real selling point um but especially what comes up for me is 
um, the, the necessity of being able to take, to get continuing education units for uh, the time that I spend in any training. Um, I, I have to think about my bottom line budgeting wise um, on like, what's my continuing education budget for the year? Um, and then where am I going to apply that money? So as a small business owner, which is essentially what any mental health clinician in private, private practice is, thinking about your financial bottom line, um, making this contribution of conducting research on AIT is also, my hope is going to be shorter, like sooner than later, is going to help support your bottom line if you want to take an AIT training. Um, us being able to have research that shows that AIT is effective is also what we will be using to submit um, to kind of the appropriate bodies for continuing education approval. Yeah, and I mean, frankly, what you were saying about being a business owner, it never hurts to have a published work with your name on it. And it's what we've used to get a speaking gig in May. Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so before we say speaking gig, and it, it sort of sounds like we're like, welcome to my TED talk, uh, we mean that we're gonna be presenting on the ethics of conducting research at the American, though the Association of Comprehensive Energy Psychology, ASEP. So we're gonna be presenting at the ASEP conference. Um, and what we are gonna be using as references is our own research that we conducted um, over the course of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could, uh, I'm keeping an eye on the time because uh, brevity is the soul of wit. So we're trying to keep it short for you. Um, and then as it relates to, you know, you said something about this before, but as it relates to why does everyone need it? So not just AITI or you, but like not to get too grandiose, but we're, we're also in the, we're in service provision. We're here to be of service to people. Um, why does why does the world need AIT or like, why does, do more people need to know about AIT? You're asking me directly? Oh yeah. All right. Well, my, my opinion of that is from my experience in my own life and also as a clinician, AIT is the most effective modality I've used across a spectrum of diagnoses and concerns. Yeah. And it can work deep. It can work light. It can be fit to your client's worldview, right? Uh, so past life or not past life, doesn't matter. You can use the right. client's worldview. And I think, but long-term, long-term the way, reason I think AIT needs to be in every clinician's toolbox is because it works and it lasts. And it's that lasting piece that you were talking about with, it doesn't, maybe it makes sense here, but you're not feeling it in the rest of your body and your whole yeah. being. AIT helps integrate that, right? So that it's a whole being approach. And I adore that part of AIT. Yeah. Um, and so speaking on like, um, when I think about why, why I'm so invested or so excited about AIT, it's one of the first interventions um, that has a manualized approach to treating um, root traumas. Yes. Uh, you know, there are other books, um, one in particular, it's called When There Are No Words. It's an EMGR therapist writing about um, infant trauma, infantile trauma. Um, and even then, what she says is like, when your client may not be resourced enough to use EMGR for this intervention, you might want to try something like bodywork, massage, Reiki. And so, you know, when I think about a foundational practice for treating root traumas, uh, the other thing that to me is, you know, so necessary in, in the world and the times that we live in, um, it's, it's my supposition that this planet has got a trauma problem, oh, yeah. <laughs> which, you know, which is to say like untreated trauma that is getting passed down generation after generation. Um, and one of the books that I read that helped me really like wrap my mind around that was uh, Resma Menachem wrote a book called My Grandmother's Hands. And what he's talking about is like trauma stored in your body that isn't even necessarily um, just from like present day activating events, even though those are going to be there. It may also be from like ancestral or intergenerational trauma, which again, we're not just saying like, maybe that's true. We're, we have research to point to, to say like, yeah, that's, that's true that 
trauma that your ancestors experienced gets passed down in your genes, shortens your telomeres, and you're having a different experience on this planet if your ancestors experienced trauma. And it's not too big of a jump to think about like the 1400s in Europe, you know, like how were things going there? Not great. <laughs> and so I'm only using that as an example. I'm not trying to say like the 1400s in the world, but if you think about your own ancestral line and you think about your own um, families and families of origin and cultures of origin, um, how would you help someone treat that trauma? If like, how? besides maybe narrative therapy, but again, how are you going to get like down into like the root activation in somebody's body? So why do we need AIT and research on it? Uh, it's the first kind of, like you said, for me, my experience is it's extraordinarily effective. And it's one of the first times I felt equipped to say to a client, I know how to work through ancestral and intergenerational trauma with you. Yeah. Yep. And before that, I had the heart, but none of the history. I had the desire, but not the skill set. Yeah, and Beth, you were bringing up a really good point about um, this being manualized because there are extensive protocols. And so whether you've been using therapy uh, yourself or as a clinician or AIT, it doesn't, the point I'm getting to is the longevity of experience may matter to your confidence, but it doesn't matter to the protocols because there is always something you can follow, even newbies. Yep. Yep. That's really what great. A, yeah. What a gift. Yeah. And so, um, as it relates to how, how would you conduct research on, um, on AIT as an AIT clinician with perhaps zero experience of doing a doctoral dissertation or uh, conducting any sort of research? Um, it was my experience that this was the very first time I ever did anything like this. So I wasn't starting with some sort of uh, framework on how. Um, I just tried. And me trying was good enough to get something out there in the world on, on advanced integrative therapy. Yeah, me too. Same here. I have never published an article or done a case study. And here we both sit having completed that. That's right. That's pretty exciting. And so uh, as, a, as a brief aside for anybody thinking about doing this, uh, one of the things that was the most helpful for me about doing that was having an accountability partner who, you know, unsurprisingly is Tabitha. Um, that we, we were individually accountable, but then accountable to each other. So there's something about knowing that if I'm going to be meeting with you in two weeks, and if I say, I haven't done anything, <laughs> it's not going to feel, it's not going to feel great. And so, you know, even if I did like some writing right before we met, I had, I had somewhere and someone to be accountable to. And that was something as it relates to the how, which is what we're going to move on to next is like, how do you do it? Um, yeah, I second the accountability partner. I know that is what pushed that forward on the timeline that it happened. And I want to just put a little word of thought out there. Be mindful about who your partner is, because there were a couple of times both of us showed up with like, yeah, I don't even remember what I was supposed to have done. <laughs> and we were encouraging. Right. Right. right? <laughs> so no shame. Yeah, yeah right. Um, as if, yeah, as if anybody needs any more of that in their, uh, in their lives, any more additional stress. Um, right. So that a supportive, you know, a supportive working environment. Um, so then when we talk about the other, how, mm -hmm. you know, how, what I mean then is like, how would you be able to quantify and show that AIT is effective? So if you, um, well, a couple of things. First, one big how is you need to understand what your study actually is, right? I mean, I felt initially like I had this burden that I had to prove AIT was valid. And it turns out I can't do that with a case study. <laughs> and right. so just take that pressure off of yourself. Understand that you are documenting both for growth as a person yourself, but also for other clinicians. One of the core things that I did so that I knew what my study was about was two things. One, go look at the expectations that journals have for how your study should be formatted. And we can unpack that a little bit in a minute. Um, the second thing is understand how to demonstrate 
effectiveness and document what is occurring. And so there are scaling questionnaires and screening tools that you can use. And again, we can unpack that in a minute. But the bottom line for me was I had to understand what the purpose of my study was. And it was two things. One, I wanted the experience. And that's valid in itself. Doing a study, even if it never gets published, is a huge growth experience. Yeah. The other is, I just wanted to demonstrate the process of AIT because I've not seen anything like it. And so I was not attached to the outcome. My outcome, my client's outcomes were spectacular, and we can talk about that another time too. Um, but just being prepared and understanding step by step what you're going to be doing was the foundation. And we can have some resources for people in links down below if that would work. Yeah. Out. Yeah. What was your experience? Um, as it relates to the how, um, things just felt like they were kind of lining up that another colleague of ours who's in the research committee said the international journal of healing and caring, um, is really open to, uh, receiving case studies. So what I did was shot an email to someone and he said, yeah, here's how you do that. The care report outline is what you would be using to write a case study. So what he put me in front of was an, of an outline on how to write it. Now, uh, I want to, you know, a word of caution is that's what the International Journal of Healing and Caring expects. It's not what every journal would expect necessarily. But in that case, I sent an email to someone. He got back to me and said, yeah, if you were going to write a case study, here's how I would want you to do it. So I had an outline to follow, which was very helpful. Um, and the other thing that I experienced was I only used one scaling instrument, which is called the dissociative experiences scale. And in the case of my client, her dissociative experiences scale didn't go down over the course of time in which we did it. it we did therapy. We did AIT. It went up. Yeah. And I still published work on how AIT is effective how it worked for the client. And I also had the ability to kind of lightly compare using EMDR with my client and using AIT with my client, which ultimately became their preference, uh, with AIT. Yeah. And so the instruments that you could use, again, like some links in, um, in concert with this webinar, uh, but there are free scaling instruments that you could use that are not necessarily psychological testing. You can find them online, uh, seven questionnaire, like seven item questionnaires about anxiety, depression. So it isn't this idea that you're gonna like carve out hours of psycho psychological testing pre and post. What a case study really is, is just you documenting what it's like to be working with a client. So it isn't that you need to prove anything by like the numbers did this, this is what this uh, graph looks like now. Um, so we're, we're coming up on our time, actually. Um, and time flies. But as we had agreed, we're going to try and keep it short so uh, people don't feel kind of over, overwhelmed with information. Um, I want to add one quick thing about the how, which is, for me, I had a different experience than you. Um, I tenacity may be required. I wanted to publish in a, um, a journal that fit my background. And so initially it was APA style. And that changed three times by the time I got my article published. And mm -hmm. I gotta tell you, <laughs> it was a lot of work, but I enjoyed it and I certainly grew. So mm -hmm. tenacity is required. And there's also an outline on the ASEP website that could be helpful. So we can put those links down below. All right, yeah. we, need to, we need to move on. So what's next? Um, where would you take a case study? Well, I think that to an industry journal, hopefully peer reviewed, mm -hmm. right? uh, because there is some validity that goes with that. Um, I think if you belong to a professional organization, start there. So for example, I started with the Associ American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy and their journal. And my second round was through the Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology, of which I'm a member. And that that is actually how I got mine published was through that process. 
but start mm. with your licensing board. They may also have journals that are available. And my encouragement would be, um, not because there's anything wrong with it, but that we've got the other, the other gift of research is that we're kind of moving, uh, moving AIT out of like the shadowy ephemeral world of energy psychology using some like language shifts into putting it like firmly in the clinical world as like an effective clinical trauma intervention. And so don't be shy or don't be afraid, right, to go to, you know, you want to submit it to APA, do it. You want to submit it to somewhere where you're like, they would never accept this. It doesn't really matter. Um, the practice is kind of the, the gift of, of what came out of it, but also, also that we want AIT to grow um, and by so doing, expose more people to it. Uh, the other thing is what a case study does for, um, for AIT is it helps build the argument that further research needs to be conducted on this intervention. So with a number of case studies on how AIT works on eating disorders, how AIT works with depression, I wrote my case study about the very specific identified goal that my client had that they wanted to work on ancestral trauma. And I was so happy to be able to say, I can do that. I can help you with that instead of go, yeah, sounds good. I, I don't know where would I refer you that I could say because of my AIT training. Yeah, I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so be bold, right? So be tenacious, but also be bold because um, you could be the third person that ever wrote any published research on AIT, <laughs> right? Like you're not, um, there isn't, uh, there isn't like a, a room full of experts that you don't belong in. Um, we yeah. just tried something and, um, and in my case, it got published and I got a lot of editing support from the International Journal of Healing and Caring, which was a real gift. And, you know, conversely felt very tiring at the time. And then for Tabitha, your experience was like, you had to just keep sending it out and then tweaking it for people the way that they were asking for it. But ultimately uh, the finished product, because the beginning product and the finished product was always AIT helped my client. Correct. AIT treated my client's trauma. Yep. Right. Um, so then we're going to share some links um, with AIT on like, where do you find these scaling resources? Um, you know, where would you go on ASAP's website to find, um, you know, how to write a case study? How would you uh, submit it to them? And then related to you know, where do you find more of us if this content felt like it was helpful or if it felt like it was inspiring or energizing? Um, why don't you speak on that? And then it'll be it'll just be time for us to wrap up. OK, well, if you are interested in writing for AIT, you can absolutely contact the administration there and they'll mm -hmm. route any information that we can support you with. Um, to us, and that is one way to go about that. Uh, we both also have websites that you can visit if you want to get a bigger snapshot of who we are and what we do. Um, but I think in general, Beth, what I would say is next step is contact AIT because they already have channels set up so that they can support you, and we'd be happy to be there too. Right. And so thank you for even considering this. Um, you know, one of the other things, just as a brief aside, that really helped us through this process, or at least helped me through this process, um, was thanks to AIT buddies and thanks to my own work, treating what arose in me that was feeling like a barrier to me being able to complete this. So if, if the first thing that comes up for you is like, oh my God, I don't have anything to say that anybody else wants to hear. 
Um, rather than just sort of like letting that voice kind of run your day, stopping and going, okay, well then if that's what's the barrier, let me, let me find a way to treat that. So then I can like kind of get free to grow into my own power. Um, so that was one of the greatest experiences I had with, um, doing this writing was seeing where I felt really limited by some of my own like blocking beliefs, but then taking action, uh, on them instead of going, oh, well, that is true. So I guess I might as well just stop trying. And that, that willingness to work on our own stuff, because I had, a, I called my AIT buddy, <laughs> you know, during the process, because uh, there was a big chunk of rejection that I experienced after, sure. you know, the marriage and family therapists were like, well, it's an okay article, but there weren't more than one person in the room. That's the entire reason they rejected it. Yeah. Right. So do reach out and do use your AIT buddy and what better way to continue building your own practice as well because those issues are the same thing keeping you stuck wherever you're stuck that's right um so thank you for taking the time to watch this i hope it was helpful um you can find us on the internet um or you know any links below and the very best of luck to you in all of the ways that you are planning on growing in 2022. Thank you.